Okay. Welcome, everybody. It's 2 o'clock. And we'll get started with our next press conference, which is on the Great Mississippi Flood of 2011. We have three speakers who are going to speak in this order. Alex Coker, who is the assistant professor. He's an assistant professor at the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium in Chauvin, Louisiana. Um, Nicole Kahn, she's a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And Darrell Scott, who is assistant professor in, in biological systems engineering at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University in Blacksburg, Virginia. Well, thank you all for very much for attending this event. I'm happy to talk to you and be part of this team that's going to talk to you about the Great Mississippi River flood of, uh, of 2011. Let me just start this show. And uh, I'm Alex, I'm down at uh, Louisiana University's uh, Marine Consortium. I'll acknowledge that I had a number of co-authors and students that were very helpful and a lot of uh, groups chipped in for, for funding this work. Um, I'll just cut to the chase at the beginning. The 2011 flood was a, a really a colossal event. It discharged uh, enough uh, water to raise global sea level by 1.4 millimeters, so that's a, a huge number. It resulted in complex and at sometimes almost bizarre oceanographic conditions on the intercontinental so, uh, shelf and um, a massive discharge of sediments to the coastal zone. Um, there was some local land as formed as a result of this flood, uh, but most of the sediments appeared to bypass the wetlands and were discharged onto the continental shelf, um, at least as far as our research goes. And let me just set the stage for one second. If when we're talking about South Louisiana, one of the biggest things that we have to keep in mind is the scale of the land loss that's occurred in South Louisiana. Over the past century, there's been almost 2,000 square miles, 1,900 square miles of land loss in South Louisiana over the past century. Uh, that's roughly equivalent to the size of Delaware, so a massive amount of land. And that has implications for habitat for numerous species, uh, not the least of which is our own. This uh, storm surges, uh, the loss of land allowed storms from hurricanes to progress further inland. And this is just gives you an example of that. This is a house in the lower ninth ward in New Orleans after Katrina. The land loss in Louisiana has had uh, an important um, impact for, for our own species. And with that in mind, I'll set the stage. Also, when we're talking about South Louisiana, we need to talk about the river. All of South Louisiana, all of the Mississippi River Delta was created by the Mississippi River. Uh, changes in course of the Mississippi River over time lead to changes in patterns in sediment deposition. Uh, and that has led to this landscape that we call the Mississippi River Delta. Today, I'll be talking mostly about work that we did in the Atchafalaya River, in the Atchafalaya Bay, Atchafalaya River system and on the continental shelf, and a little bit out here on the bird's foot. Uh, this is, again, uh, an, in, an impact of the total hydrological flux that we had to, the, had to the Gulf of Mexico. So that's on the order of 460 uh, cubic kilometers, enough to raise global sea level by about 1.4 millimeters, or enough roughly to flood the city of San Francisco about a half a mile deep. So a tremendous amount of, uh, of fresh water that entered the, the coastal ocean. This is what the flood looked like at its peak, particularly on the Atchafalaya River shelf. You can see sediment being discharged on the shelf. You can see uh, plumes often kept uh, close, somewhat close to the coastal ocean, to the coastal zone by uh, onshore winds. So you can really see this nice, distinct sediment plume. Uh, if we look at salinities, what we might see, for those of you that don't know, salinity in the ocean ranges from zero to about 35 parts per thousand. If you were to jump off to the ocean here, you'd be in 35 parts per thousand salinity. In, this is salinities in the Atchafalaya River system and Atchafalaya River shelf. So two parts per thousand is almost drinkable. Uh, in here we had water typically that was uh, often that was fresh enough to drink far enough out to sea that you couldn't see land. Just to put that in perspective, if you were in the Chesapeake Bay, an area that has a lot of rivers flowing into it, and you were 50 miles inland in the Chesapeake Bay system, you could be in water saltier than, than this. So an enormous discharge of water to the, to the coastal ocean. If we just take a look at one system, one, uh, one, one of these areas in detail, what we might see is uh, this flood produced really complex hydrographic 
uh, conditions. If I'll just show you here, red is temperature. For those of you that know most often, temperature as you go down in the water column uh, decreases with depth. Everyone that's been swimming in a lake knows this. It gets colder as you go down to the bottom. Actually, here we find the opposite. Uh, we actually find warmer waters uh, as you go down to the bottom, largely because you've had such a massive discharge of cold, fresh water coming down the Mississippi River. So almost bizarre conditions. Also, if you look at salinity, salinity is, you know, salinity at the surface is very close to uh, about two parts per thousand. Uh, here, as and then within a, a course of a meter, and with course or a half a meter, we go from two parts per thousand to 20 parts per thousand. So increase of salinity by almost an order of magnitude by over a by, uh, over a spatial scale of about a foot or so, foot or maybe just a little more. So almost bizarre hydrographic conditions. If we look at sediment accumulation rates, this is work that was done. A lot of it was done by my uh, student Apuula, who will be talking at 5:12 this afternoon. And what he showed was sediment accumulation rates in the Wax Lake Delta following the event that are on the order of about a centimeter or so a year, maybe less in some spots, maybe more in other spots. And if you look offshore, he found sediment, we found sediment accumulation rates that are on the order of uh, say nine to set five to 17 centimeters a year, almost an order of magnitude greater, suggesting that much that while there may have been some de sediment deposit in here, much of the, the uh, sediments was, were discharged offshore. Now, it doesn't mean there was no land created. It doesn't mean that there was no sediments that were built. This is, I'll show you an area here for just a second. This is the West Bay Mississippi River diversion. This is an area where they've cut a hole in the river levee with the hope of reinitiating the natural land building processes that built South Louisiana. This cut was made in 2002. Almost nothing happened for a period of about 10, for a period of several number of years. And then following the flood, there were a few spits of land that were formed. Uh, this is one little spit of land that is called Walters Island. Uh, all told, we're looking at, you know, on the order, at least in West Bay, of several square, square kilometers worth of land, not a tremendous amount when you put it in the uh, coastal system. Uh, just to wrap this up, this was a major event that affected North America's largest uh, delta. And if we're going to talk about coastal, about restoration in Louisiana, uh, we need to talk about sediments uh, as, as part of um, critical to sort of the long-term survival of, Amer of North America's largest delta. And with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Nicole, who's going to fill us in a little bit more about uh, land building and sediment deposition elsewhere. So hi, thanks for the introductions, uh, Alex. Um, my name is Nicole Kahn. I'm a PhD student from the University of Pennsylvania. And today I'll be talking about the results from a large interdisciplinary group uh, working on understanding how river plumes deliver sediments to on and offshore or on and near shore environments dur during flood events. So to provide an overview of our findings, um, we found that during this flood event, uh, large amounts of sediment were delivered to coastal marshes. And we estimate a total of 13 million metric tons of sediment were delivered to the Atchafalaya and the Birdsfoot Basins during this event. We also found that the Atchafalaya Basin uh, experienced greater wetland deposition compared to the Birdsfoot Delta. And we relate this to the physical characteristics of the sediment plumes produced during the flood. And then finally, we use the novel application of um, microscopic organisms, diatoms, which live in coastal waters and sediments, uh, to understand how these uh, sediments were routed during this event um, and potentially previous events. So uh, Alex already put this figure up before, but it just highlights uh, that we that increasing our understanding of how marshes maintain their elevation with respect to rising sea level is so important in the system because there has been an alarming uh, rate of wetland loss here. So in red, we have areas of wetland loss from 1932 to 2000. And then in the light green color, it's areas of land gain from, again, 1932 to 2000. 
And what we see is around the bird's foot delta and in the Barataria and Terrebonne basins, there's been large amounts of wetland loss. In the Atchafalaya, there's actually been uh, increases in wetland growth. And part of what this, our work touches on is uh, the river that rolls, the, sorry, the role that rivers play in these contrasting wetland gain and wetland uh, loss trends in the Atchafalaya and the bird's foot basins. So during the flood event of 2011, uh, the decision was made to open the Morganza Spillway, which caused the slow flooding uh, of the Atchafalaya Basin, and at the same time, uh, high sustained flows through the southwest pass of the Bird's Foot were maintained, which uh, allowed for a, um, us to test our, the three main hypotheses that are driving this work. So the first hypothesis just says that plumes produced during uh, the flood should result in enhanced wet wetland sedimentation. And then the second and the third um, relate the shape of the sediment plumes to their ability to distribute sediments during the flood. So the jet-like outflow from the Mississippi River should contribute little to wetland sedimentation during this event. And the diffuse and wide plume produced in the Atchafalaya should be the main contributor of sediment. So to confirm our hypotheses, uh, we have observed the Mississippi River plume through satellite analysis and in situ, in situ measurements from a boat survey. Um, and I won't describe these results any further. Uh, Carol Lutkin and Federica Falcini are both in the audience and can answer any questions on that piece of the work. But what I was involved in was the surface sediment sampling. So we accessed uh, 45 sites via helicopter and measured uh, flood deposition depth and sampled sediments for their physical characteristics and biological indicators contained within the sediments. And so what we found was greatest accumulation in the Atchafalaya Basin, um, and this is in units of grams per centimeter squared. Intermediate uh, amounts of accumulation in the bird's foot where uh, some deposition occurred in smaller tributaries uh, or so smaller diversions off of the Southwest Pass and little to no deposition in the Terrebonne and Barataria basins, which weren't directly affected by floodwaters. And these observations uh, confirm my, our hypotheses and indicate that the shape of sediment plumes and their physical characteristics um, are related to their ability to deliver sediments to coastal marshes. And so we find unique assemblages of diatoms, which again are microscopic organisms, commonly termed algae, which are encased in these ornate glass shells, basically. Um, so before the flood, it, under typical conditions, we would expect that the marsh surface should be dominated by pennate forms, um, like Navicula aerofuga. And then during the height of the flood, uh, as the marsh surface is inundated by waters and there's increased flow over the surface, we would expect centric forms of diatoms um, which float freely in the water column to be incorporated into the sediments as they settle out of suspension. And then finally, after the flood, we would expect a return to uh, pennate forms dominating the marsh surface. And so when we look at the centric to pennate ratio of the diatoms contained in the marsh sediments, uh, we find that there's an increase in the centric diatoms in the surface flood deposits compared to the underlying sediments below in the flood affected basins. So these results uh, indicate that this quantity of the centric to pennate ratio uh, may be a good indication of flood deposition. And so just to sum up um, with a few words the significance of our findings. Um, first, we found that the Mississippi River is inefficient compared to the Atchafalaya. Um, it, in delivering sediment to uh, marshes during large flood events. Um, most of the sediments that were sent down the Southwest Pass were largely lost from the system and unavailable to the declining marshes in the uh, Louisiana coast. And then finally, um, we may have come up with a tool to uh, search for former large-scale flood events like the 2011 flood in sedimentary archives which will uh, enable us to be able to assess the overall importance in large floods and the river in sustaining and helping marshes maintain 
um, their elevations in Louisiana's, Louisiana's deltaic wetlands. So we're going to switch gears a little. We're going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about uh, nutrient removal within the Tafalaya Basin. Um, I do want to just point out the, the list of people that are associated with this with this work that we're doing. Um, a whole host of folks from LSU, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, um, and Virginia Tech, and the funding for our work is largely coming through the National Science Foundation. Um, just a little bit of a setup in terms of the study. A colleague who's in the audience, Richard Keim, and I had been working in the Chafalaya Basin, um, and we had planned a preliminary investigation this year to look at the Great Flood, or to look at a flood. Um, and I happened to go down in early May, and we had some sampling in, uh, in April that had, that had gone on. I was down there in early May, and we're looking at the river levels, and they were going up and up, and all of a sudden, they say, well, we might be open up the Morganza. I was like, whoa. So um, it was somewhat fortuitous in that sense. Our, this is a, a picture in the right-hand side of uh, the Old River control structure. Um, standing there, I don't know how many of you in the audience that were down there during this time, the amount of water moving through was just amazing. Uh, it kind of made, made you tingle in the sense that uh, it, was, it was an amazing amount of water, lots of power. Um, and our primary driver, driving question relates to uh, how much the Chafalaya uh, floodway reduces water pollution. And we generally think about this in terms of does the basin, how well does the basin act like a filter or a kidney versus a pipe and just shunting nutrients and sediment through the basin itself. And this is just a conceptual diagram. Um, on the left-hand side, I'm supposed to use the pointer up there it is. On the left-hand side is a conceptual diagram of a channel, and the right-hand side would be the swamp itself. And so during, during a flood, as you're moving water and sediment and nutrients through the Chafalaya Basin, you're getting overbank, uh, uh, over, overbank flow, which means water's going out into the, into the woods or the forested swamp, and then there's the potential for removal of nutrients um, uh, sedimentation, uh, carbon sequestration, and, and the like. Um, and so we were generally interested in this area, thinking about that connection from the river out into uh, the swamp and set up a, a sampling protocol to capture that. Um, these are just some pictures of the opening of the Morganza. Um, as Alex referred to, uh, stated, it was a, a, a colossal event. Um, and the Morganza itself has only been opened up twice now um, since, uh, since, since its inception. Um, on the lower left-hand side of this uh, figure here is the amount of water that was moving through the Chafalaya Basin. Um, basically, there's an, an inflow on the top end of the basin at Simsport, um, where a portion of the Mississippi comes in, and then there's two main outflows. And so, Looking at the difference between them, which is that blue line on the diagram, is how much water came through the Morganza spillway. And this just gives you an idea of this. The colors that you're looking on the right-hand side here is uh, all along the Mississippi River that it was in ex uh, extreme flooding conditions. And so the river was extremely, extremely high. Um, and that's the, the, the rationale in terms of opening up the Morganza to prevent downstream flooding in the cities of Baton Rouge and New Orleans. So the sampling for our study um, occurred weekly over the 2011 flood. Um, and basically what I want to just point out is uh, the right-hand side, this is the, Morgan, uh, this is the Chafalaya Basin. And we had samples collected uh, weekly at over 40 different sites and different synoptics, synoptic samples that's, uh, in, in order to capture the spatial variability of, um, of nutrients and carbon moving through in sediment. Um, 
And so some quick results for you. Um, the numbers that you're looking at are the amount of uh, uh, the flow of water, the amount of water in cubic feet per second. Uh, you multiply these numbers by 1,000. And when you do that and you look at what's coming up from the, from the top to the bottom, uh, the numbers suggest that about 50% of the flow probably moved through the swamp or this, this, this forested wetland. Um, which is, which is uh, much higher than normal and during a normal given flooding year where the numbers are only ranging from 10 to 15 percent. Um, and this is one example of some of the nutrient data that we're getting. Um, and what you can see here is this is for total dissolved nitrogen on the y-axis, and this is in concentration of micromolar. Um, which I was pointed out to me. I should be using parts per million for you all, but sorry about that. I'm a geeky scientist. Uh, but on the, on the x-axis here is month. Um, and so the, the, the morganza was opened up right in the middle of May. Uh, and if you look at the, the red and the blue, that's the upper basin and mid basin in terms of nitrogen concentrations. The black line, or the black dots, are concentrations of nitrogen measured right exiting the swamp itself. And so what you see is a, a significant amount of removal of the total, total dissolved nitrogen, um, which is a good thing. The swamp was acting as a filter. And so some conclusions um, that the river itself um, and, and delivery of water from the river into the swamp is decreasing, uh, it, it decreases nutrients, um, and we see that, as we, we, in our data, we're seeing that with nitrate and, with nitrate and uh, total dissolved nitrogen. Um, the swamp is acting as a filter. Um, and the reason this is really important and critical is because there's efforts out there to increase the connectivity of swamp to, or of, of the river to the swamps. Um, and it's one, one component of a larger management um, to reduce uh, the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia zone, um, which I'm sure all of you in the room have heard of. Thank you. Now, open it up for questions if anyone in the audience has a question. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. This is Carolyn Gramling from Science Magazine. Uh, I guess this is a question for Darrell Scott. Um, I'm wondering, are there any adverse effects from the total dissolved nitrogen loading into the forested wetland um, that you can look at or anything that you can say about that? Um, that, that that's a good question. Uh, we, so part of the sampling, we did a lot of uh, measurements of dissolved oxygen within the forested wetland itself. Um, and we didn't, there was definitely a concern that DO was going to drop significantly and, and affect, uh, uh, infect the biota, but it didn't drop significantly. So it was about five days, five to seven days to get through the, through the uh, swamp, uh, and we didn't see really low DO concentrations. Hi, Peter Oltz with uh, New Scientist magazine. Uh, I guess I'm trying to get a sense of whether there are any surprises in these results or whether they're kind of all confirming what you expected. I mean, in terms of what I heard while the flood was happening in terms of where the land, you know, where there was deposition of sediments, it sounds pretty much as what people were predicting, but I wasn't, you know, I haven't done any prior reporting on the uh, filtering of nitrates. So it would just be helpful to have some pointers. Is this just confirming what you expected was going to happen or whether there was anything surprising in the results that you've talked about today? Do you want to use that? I, I can take a, take a start at that. I think that some of the areas of sediment deposition that we've noticed are, are probably within our, within our current understanding of the Mississippi River Delta 
you know, it's, it's not news to say that the major sources of, of sediments and fresh water to the coastal zone are the Mississippi and the Atchafalaya River. So I think with that respect, it, um, it was, that's not necessarily new. I, I think that the size of the, the amount of material that we found, at least in our research, the amount of material that we found offshore is somewhat surprising. The normal deposition rates offshore in the areas that we looked are on the order of a centimeter or two a year, a few centimeters a year, so an inch a year or less. Um, for English speakers, and offshore we were looking at you know, roughly an order of magnitude, roughly a factor of 10 greater. So for our work, I thought that that was surprising. Just the amount of material that was blown offshore um, was somewhat surprising. And I think the hydrographic conditions that we found on the uh, offshore were surprising as well, Ju in that, you know, that, that plot of temperature that I showed you. Where, typical, where temperature patterns were opposite of what you might expect. And we found that other patterns that were also somewhat complex and, and unexpected in terms of the hydrographic conditions. So in that respect, I think we did find some things that were uh, unique to this flood. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that statement there. Um, yeah, it's no surprise that the rivers should deposit sediments um, in these marshes during a flood, but the degree to which or the amount of sediment that they delivered was a bit surprising. Um, you know, we found amounts of sediment deposition that were greater than the coastwide average in the marshes in the Atchafalaya Basin. So, yeah, that was a little surprising, the total amount that we found. And that's good news in terms of increasing... Right, so... Um, right, yeah, it uh, um, will help... It can potentially help marshes maintain their elevation with respect to rising sea levels. Mm -hmm. But but it's also important, I, I try to stay away from good and bad news as a scientist, but it's also Im important to think about the amount of sediment that wasn't delivered to the marshes because the river because the river because of the configuration, the current configuration of the river. Right? The the river does with the exception of the Atchafalaya, the river does not flow the Mississippi River does not flow through, flow through the Mississippi River Delta to much of a meaningful extent. Um, most of most the Mississippi River is very heavily channelized, and as a result, the for example the the Barataria and Terrebonne basins that uh, that Nicole showed used to receive river water, and now they receive very little um, because that because the river has been very heavily channelized for flood protection and uh, and navigation purposes. So. I think that that's, that's worth keeping in mind, is not that, yes, there was some mar material delivered to marshes, and I think that that will keep their, help them keep pace with sea level rise, but, but the hydro, yeah. One, one, and from the nitrogen perspective or nutrient perspective, what I would say is that um, the idea that a swamp is a filter is not necessarily new either. Uh, but what, we, what, we, what, we, what we're seeing is that the system's underutilized for the potential for removing more nutrients. And so um, increasing that conductivity, if you will, uh, and increasing the amount of water nutrients getting through the Tafalaya Basin is, can be a really good thing and important from a management perspective. Yes, Mike Karlowitz from NASA Earth Observatory. I was wondering if you <clears throat> wonder if any of you, you were speaking about what's happening along the coast, but can any of you say anything about what was happening further inland? In other words, uh, was there any sediment deposition further upland, any changes to sort of the river bed further inland, even up, you know, M Missouri, Arkansas? For, uh, I'm getting my states wrong, but <laughs> did anything happen further up, or it was also just a matter of the river is just so heavily managed that there's no change? I don't think, the, I, I know people were looking at this. I, I know the three of us were not, uh, so we're probably the wrong people to talk about. Two people that have done good work on the river. Um, I think there were several teams out there. Uh, Meet Allison from the University of Texas was out in the river, and Jeff Nitrauer from the University of Illinois was also out in the river. And I think that they're probably the better people to talk to, to, talk to about what's happening uh, up in the river, the, up in the river. I'm a coastal scientist, so I didn't look at the, that area. Uh, Harvey Leifert, freelance. Oh, was it Randy's turn? Okay, sorry. Harvey Leifert, freelance. Uh, I would just like to follow up a little on the, the two outflows 
is the reason that the, the Mississippi Channel didn't deposit much sediment usefully because of the force of the narrowly channeled river that just pushed it out over the cliff in the water? Or is it that the cliff was nearer to the mouth of the Mississippi than to the mouth of the Atchafalaya? Well, I, that, that's, a good, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I think, well, yes, it's true that the birds, you know, the Southwest Pass is closer to the edge of the continental shelf, if that's like what you're referring to. Yeah, that's what I call the cliff, yeah. Well, so there's that factor, but then, um, yes, it did have to do a lot with the flow that was produced coming out of the Southwest Pass. And, um, you know, this is actually a, a model by <laughs> Federico, who's sitting right here in the room, who might be able to talk about this better later. But um, yes, it was a, com a combination of the two, but we were primarily concerned with the characteristics of the flow. But I'll, I'll just also follow up. The, the river on the Mississippi River side is constrained by behind a series of levees, um, and there is some spillover over the top of the le over the top of those levees, particularly as you get down south uh, of Venice. There's or southeast of Venice, there's some spillover. Um, around the Bohemia Spillway, there's a few cuts in those levees where there's some flow out. But for the most part, the lower Mississippi River is pretty heavily channelized. Uh, you, and that constrains the flow and prevents uh, and hinders sediment deposition. So for example, Southwest Pass, which, which she was talking about, there are rocks along that, you know, all the way out to, you know, out, out to sea. Uh, some some distance, so that can, that configuration constrains the flow uh, substantially. Now there is some material that gets out through side passes and over some smaller levees down in the lower re region, but the flow is is relatively heavily constrained, and that's you know all the way up from uh, well, up from St. Louis all the way down all the way down to Venice. Venice being the point at which the the river sort of splits out. I have a follow up. Uh I remember when the gates were opened, uh, we all saw it on TV, and for a day or two, we followed what was happening, and then it sort of went away. Uh, I remember that there was projected to be, or actually was, a lot of damage to farmland and uh, some homes, businesses. That having been done now, is there a case to be made for keeping that open all the time so that a certain amount of water flows through the Atchafalaya Basin and deposits those sediments. Well, uh, uh, just to put it in context, a third, roughly a third of the Mississippi River water, a little less than a third, does flow through the Atchafalaya River Basin. There's a control, a control structure there that is regulated so that 30% of the combined flow of the Mississippi and Red River goes down the Atchafalaya River. So when Durrell was, uh, when Scott was talking about uh, about it, I, you know, that's, there is a lot that goes down normally, and so uh, the, the additional flow is, you know, extra is extra flood protection for the the cities of New Orleans and Baton Rouge when the river gets to be exceptionally high. I think, I think, permanently. I'm not going to comment on permanently keeping the Morganza open, but if you get it within the basin itself, in terms of increasing trying to increase the connectivity of Old River to the swamp, that is something that is, is being encouraged for sure. Randy? Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS, uh, newspaper of the American Geophysical Union. Uh, I think this is a question for Nicole. Um, I'd appreciate if you could elaborate on what you indicated toward the end of uh, your talk. Um, that uh, regarding that you may have come up with uh, a tool to search for former flood events in uh, the sedimentary archive. So I'm wondering if you can provide some more details about the tool, how useful it is or could be, including perhaps compared to other such tools. Um, and does the tool have application for the Mississippi River system only or for other systems as well? Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. That's a, a good question. Um, I didn't show the results from all of our analyses uh, in this short talk, but we did a bunch of physical measurements of the sediments as well, the organic matter content, the bulk density, and the grain size distributions. And um, sorry, we found that there were no distinguishable 
it, you couldn't tell between flood and pre-flood sediment on the basis of the physical characteristics alone. Um, so then to talk more about the diatom assemblages that we found in the sediments. Um, so for all of the cores that I showed up there, we did in the flood affected basins find a significant increase, you know, on average about a 200% increase in the centric diatoms that were in the flood sediments. Um, and that's over a very large area. Um, so we covered what, about 300 kilometers of land. So that's good indication that this is a good proxy for flood deposition. Um, and I should also mention that the analysis of those of the diatom assemblages is still ongoing, so I still have to do a lot of the taxonomic identifications, and that will provide us with more answers about whether we can use this tool um, in other locations. So the work is still ongoing, but I think at least the initial results that we have are very promising. And one way to test it is, um, you know, to go and take cores in the marshes in Louisiana and see, you know, we, there are. Um, events, like there's a 1930 flood that we would expect to see there. And so around that boundary, we could see, do we see an increase in the centric tax of diatoms there to, to test if it actually does work. And uh, could you also just put your tool in perspective with perhaps other tools? Um, well, the, phys the physical characteristics of the sediment, is that what, what you're talking about? Well, I, I'm assuming that there are other such tools or, or that people have determined for looking into um, um, former flood events from sedimentary archives. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong, but if there are such other mm -hmm. tools, I'd appreciate well, if you could perhaps put it in context. Um, I mean, typically bit large scale flood events are determined by increases in, in grain size or just differences in lithologies of the sediment. Um, People have also looked at different microfossil groups. I know foraminifera have been used. Um, but we didn't look at forams in this study, but we did look at physical characteristics, which traditionally would be used. And we found that diatoms could indicate a flood deposit, whereas the physical characteristics couldn't. Can I just chime in? One, one thing we used was the naturally occurring radioisotope beryllium-7. It, it's not new to our work. Other people have used it before, but it's, um, it's produced actually in the, in the upper atmosphere when rays from the, the sun split apart atoms of carbon and nitrogen. And it has a, it, it's uh, chemically, it's sticky, it sticks to particle surfaces, and it has a really short half-life, 53 days. And so all of our measurements of sediment deposition were done using beryllium-7, because since it has a short half-life, it's got a 53 days, it has to have been delivered to that area relatively recently. And that, that's what we used. It, it's not a new technique. Other people have used it before. I think Nicole's technique is really promising because it's, it's new and I think it's neat because it's biological. Um, but and to, well, and to add to that too, for using um, radiometric methods, hmm. the, you know, the half-life of beryllium-7 is something like... It's 50, 53, 53 days, yeah. So it, wor it works great for floods. We're not the first to use it, I think. But if we wanted to look back and assess yeah. the... You can use, um, the you can use other isotopes records. too with yeah. longer half-lives. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that yours is particularly neat because it's biological. Yeah. Um, Lizzie Grossman, Freelance. Um, all of your presentations were talking about what was happening in the, what you looked at in the immediate aftermath of the flood in terms of delivery of sediments and nutrients. And I was wondering about follow-up studies that you or colleagues might have planned to look at longer-term impacts of de the delivery of those sediments and nutrients, including not just physical impacts to that coastal area, but also biological and broader ecological impacts? I mean, I, I will say a lot of us were funded on rapid grants that, that are short-term, but, 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 but I will also say we do have, we're being in South Louisiana, we do have plans to follow this up. Um, one interesting hypothesis that my grad student, Cindy Ramachandran, has been proposing is that a lot of uh, material from the, um, from the Mississippi or from the Atchafalaya uh, moves downstream, down west to, um, to the Chenier Plain, which is an interesting area of high and low uh, ridges. And she's been looking at the relationship between the Atchafalaya River flow and uh, the development of wetlands in the Chenier Plain. And so that's one thing that we are certainly looking at. And that really gets into the question of, you know, are, where does this material go after the flood pulse? And so 
we're, uh, we're actually out starting a week from today looking at that. So we, we do have plans to follow it up. So we're in, in our group, and we're, we're thinking about also from the perspective of a management and what into the kind of forecasting into the future, if there's potential for uh, these types of events become more frequent, uh, what, are the, what are the implications and what does that mean? Um, I would like to provide uh, uh, something about uh, an answer, an additional answer about your question. The difference between the two, uh, the two outflows, sorry. My name is Federico Falcini from uh, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, so uh, we have been studying the uh, Mississippi River and the Atchafalaya outflows uh, from uh, satellite analysis since 2009. And we are actually uh, uh, discovering the systematic different behavior of these two plumes. And I think Alex say right is the extremely channelized behavior of the Mississippi River is providing this self-sharpening jet, which is very, very efficient in keeping sediment in suspension and delivering the sediment really offshore. Now, independently on the shelf break position, actually what we are discovering is a, a long gyre of those sediments that are going to feed, not the, the burst food system, but some system that is too far and, and of course cannot be fed because you're going to lose those sediments. So uh, the, the the answer is yes, there are two different behaviors. There, are, there is an hydrodynamic control of those two different behaviors. Uh, we provided some work uh, to describe this, this hydrodynamic behavior. And we are trying now to understand who drives this behavior and, of course, upstream condition of the channel geometry and maybe uh, uh, great sediment characteristic like cohesiveness and non-cohesiveness of the system may drive this, this uh, weird behavior of the Mississippi uh, birds foot outflow. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Liz Gallagher from Environmental Research Web. I've got a question for Alex. Could you comment on how the bizarre hydrological conditions you said occurred in the near shore, the effects of that on the ocean ecology and flow and so on? Um, yeah, I think that that's that's still an, that's, I think that's an area that, we're, that people are still looking at. Um, I, I'm really more on the physical and geological side rather than the ecological side. Um, so, but you know, these do play into the concept of stratification, which feeds into the, into the dead zone in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, one thing, this is not my research, but uh, my boss's research at LUMCON, who's really the expert on sort of the hypoxic zone, Nancy Rabelle. So I really refer questions on that to her. But one thing she found was that the dead zone this year was large and larger than average, but not quite as large as was predicted. Um, and so that may have played a role. I, I really, in terms of sort of coastal processes on the on the dead zone side, I really refer people to her. But that maybe, but that will help you get going. Um, I think that we are just. This is an area, actually, of the ocean that we really don't understand very well. And we're just, we're just breaking ground on it. Well, great. I think we're out of time, but thanks so much. And the next one will be, the next press conference will be at 3. Thank you.